السلام علیکم ول ڈسکس دی اسائنمنٹ نمبر ٹو ٹوڈے دی اسائنمنٹ ایز یو نو اٹ واز اے سکسٹی ایئرس اولڈ میل ود اے ہسٹری آف گرلڈ آرتھرائٹس ہائپر ٹینشن اینڈ ڈائبٹیز پریزنٹس ٹو ایمرجنسی کمپلیننگ آف سویئر ابلام پین پیشنٹ رپورٹس ایپیگیسٹک پین آن اینڈ آف فار منتھس اینڈ کمس آفٹر میل اینڈ واز ریلیو بائی ٹیکنگ اینٹیسکس بٹ فار دا لاسٹ ایٹ آورس اٹ بیکیم سویئر اینڈ واز سڈن آلسو and now he cannot even move. His blood pressure is 140 by 90, heart rate is 120, temperature 101, his mouth is dry, bowel sounds are absent. Abdomen is diffusely tender with guarding and rigidity. The BBC is 18,000, the mile is 120, and the chest x-ray done in rough posture showed free gas under diaphragm. So few important points in this scenario, uh, which I want to highlight. Old male, who is a known patient of arthritis and we all know that these patients you know usual habits of taking painkillers like NSAIDs and he complains of severe abdominal pain when he comes to emergency and he gives a past history which is very significant that he complains of this pain on and off for many months and it comes when he takes me and is relieved by taking antacids. So this point signifies that he has some sort of a particular disease, which for the last eight hours, the character and severity has changed and the patient uh, is in no severe pain. His bowel sounds are absent, the abdomen is tense, tender with guarding and rigidity. He is tachycardic and he is febrile. This is pointing out towards some sort of peritonism which is going on. and its WBCs are markedly elevated and when we have done x-ray uh, it shows free gas under the diaphragm. This is a very self-explanatory uh, scenario regarding the problem regarding a surgical complication of peptic ulcer disease. We all know that there are two types of peptic ulcer disease. One is gastric ulcers and other is duodenal ulcer which are more common and duodenal ulcer Ulcer can happen in the anterior wall, it can happen in the posterior wall and gastric ulcer, it can happen in any part of the stomach which we will see later on how we will classify it. So this is a very common scenario and when the hap- uh, ulcer happens in the anterior wall of the duodenum, it erodes that wall and it perforates and the contents of the stomach and the duodenum leaks into the peritoneal cavity leading to peritonite. Same thing happen, can happen in when the ulcer is in the posterior wall of the duodenal uh, wall. But as you know, the duodenal wall, posterior duodenal wall is in close contact with the rectoperitoneum and with the pancreas and there is not much space that the contents can leak. But a very important structure is passing behind the duodenal wall that is the gastroduodenal artery. So when the ulcer happens in the posterior wall, it erodes the duodenal artery and these ulcers bleed. So in short, the interior wall ulcers perforates and leading to peritonitis and the posterior wall ulcers, they erode the gastrointestinal artery which leading to life threatening hemorrhage. So these are the basically two common complications which we see nowadays regarding peptic ulcer disease, either perforation or either bleeding. And when it perforates, gas also escape and this leads to free gas under diaphragm. So this is a very common straightforward scenario. dealing with the perforatic peptic ulcer disease, most commonly a duodenal ulcer. So then there were few questions regarding this scenario. What is the most likely diagnosis? As I already told you, the free gas and the diaphragm indicates a patient has a perforated viscous. And this is supported by the evidence of diffuse peritonitis on the physical examination. And the most common cause of free gas and the diaphragm are perforated ulcers. or maybe some other perforated viscous. Given the long history of epigastric pain in this patient, which was relieved by antacids, the most common likely diagnosis is a perforated duodenal ulcer. So what are the common symptoms in patients with peptic ulcer disease and how can we distinguish uh, from the gastric and duodenal ulcers? The most common presenting symptoms and the signs are well localized, non-radiating, mid-epigastric abdominal pain and tenderness. However, the description and location of the pain can vary and it can be vague also. 
this chart is showing a comparison between the duodenal ulcer and the gastric ulcer. Uh, patient with gastric ulcer which you are supposed to make, patient with gastric ulcer often have pain that is brought on half an hour after eating. Food releases the stomach acid, so pain increases. As such, they may stop eating and lose weight. So these patients are afraid to eat. A patient with duodenal ulcer, on the other hand, they report that pain is relieved when they take take something, because uh, when their pain uh, when they take something, it releases the bicarbonates in the duodenum, and sort of a duodenal ulcer, sort of pain reduces. So they may gain weight because uh, when they eat the pain, when they eat the pain relieves. So they sort of eat more. Uh, other signs of symptom include nausea and vomiting, more with the gastric ulcer, sometimes malignant and vomiting of blood, more common with gastric ulcer. So what are the typical presentations for a peptic ulcer disease? Patient with cl classically present with a triad of acute onset of the pain, tachycardia and abdominal rigidity. They may occasionally complain of shoulder pain, secondary to the diaphragm irritation. And, uh, the cause of irritation of the phrenic nerve and sometimes right lower quadrant pain, right paracolic gutter pain, secondary to the fluid tracking along the right paracolic gutter as well as the abdominal distension and vomiting. And one third of the patient will have history of peptic ulcer disease as this patient had. On examination, the patient will likely to have features of peritonitis, tenderness on palpation, abdominal guarding, bold like rigidity. And depending upon the duration of the symptom, the patient may have evidence of hypovolemia secondary to the peritonitis, decrease oral intake, vomiting. And if we do the what investigation, the patient will have leukocytosis, the urea and creatinine ratio will be disturbed, showing hypovolemia. And due to the location of the pain, uh, Sometimes we have to think about pancreatitis also, so amylase is usually done. Uh, however, perforated ulcers, posterior ulcers can cause elevation of amylase. As I told you, the posterior ulcers, they are resting on the, uh, very near to the pancreatic area. So, posterior ulcer inflammation or perforation can lead to peripancreatic inflammation or little bit spillage of fluid uh, in that area, leading to the increase in amylase level. If the perforating ulcers they present late, more than 12 hours, patient can come in septic shock, which may be complained by a metabolic acidosis with high level of lactates. However, the acidosis can be marked by the respiratory compensation or by the loss of acid when the patient is vomiting. So, what are the most common causes of peptic ulcer disease? Briefly, they can be divided into either by increasing destructive forces like decrease in acid production or presence of H. pylori or maybe decrease in the protective forces like the decrease in the mucus barrier, uh, bicarbonate levels, postaglandulin and somatostatins. H. pylori accounts for more than 90% of duodenal ulcers and about 80% of gastric ulcers. In addition to producing uh, the toxic mediators that degrades the mucus, H. pylori also induces the local inflammatory reaction. And the inflammatory reaction caused by the H. pylori involves, uh, invokes hyperstition of gastrin, which lead to the increase in the acid production. And this leads to the development of the enteral gastritis. Uh, the production of postaglandulins, bicarbonates and somatostatins has been recognized to decrease the patients, a decrease in patient with H. pylori, which is normalized once the bacteria are eradicated. What are the other factors that may lead to peptic ulcer disease? It includes smoking, alcohol, steroids and stress. Cigarette smoking has been found to double the risk of developing peptic ulcer disease. And smoking results in imbalance between the mucus, uh, mucosa and proliferation. And additional cigarette smoking has an inhibitory effect on the prostaglandin and mucus production. So alcohol also damages the gastric mucosa and it stimulates the gastric uh, secretions. Uh, Cushing ulcers and stress ulcers and curling ulcers sometimes happen in head trauma and burn patients respectively. And uh, gastric secretion tumors of pancreas may lead to increased production 
and may be part of the Zollinger Ellison syndrome. So this chart shows how do you categorize the ulcers. So there are basically five categories of ulcers. Type 1 category when they are present in the lesser curvature and they are the most common and type 2 uh, they are basically present uh, distal part of the lesser curvature and in the duodenum. They are also quite common. So you can see the most common ulcers are the duodenal ulcers and in the stomach it is a present on the lesser curvature. The category 3 are the pre-pyloric area. This pre-pyloric area is just before the pylorus. So this is not including in the stomach itself. 4 is the cardiac area and the 5 is the any part of the body of the stomach. So this is how you categorize the ulcer and you, you need to remember the category. Now, vomiting. How does it changes the acid waste balance? This was a question. Uh, well, there are two types of vomiting which happens in peptic ulcer disease. One is due to the perforation, due to the hypovolemia, and due to the irritation and localized ileus. Uh, and in this question, actually, what is asked is uh, the vomiting due to the gastric outlet obstruction. The gastric outlet obstruction is usually feature of a chronic ulcer complication which leads to scar and uh, causing the uh, pyloric narrowing so, or in a very high volume vomiting that can happen. So what happens is the vo volume when patient vomits it results in the loss of the fluid which is which contains potassium and also contains stomach acid ACL. and when you lose acid too much it relative to the bicarbonate level it leads to metabolic alkalosis and if the vomiting continues the patient will also start losing sodium with water and the renal perfusion of will decrease because of dehydration and because of this dehydration the renal angiotensin and aldosterone system will kick in which will result in the reabsorption of the sodium in the water from the renal tubules and the, at the expense of the potassium points. Uh, to avoid severe hypokalemia because now the patient is losing potassium from the vom in the vomiting as well as in the urine and to stop this hypokalemia uh, which can produce arrhythmias the kidneys start to secrete hydrogen ions instead of potassium to conserve potassium and this will result in paradoxical acid urea in context of the contraction of the alkalosis. So you need to remember this. This is a very important OSCE question. Now, what are the basic principles of surgical treatment of a peptic ulcer disease? Of course, perforated. So this patient, as I told you, can present, if present early, if we present in hypovolemic shock, and if we present late, he will present in septic shock. So first of all is, the complete resuscitation of the patient and sepsis usually happens in 20 percent of this patient and therefore adequate volume resuscitation so that the organ perfusion and careful monitoring within the icu are necessary our ng tube nasogastric tube should be placed to decompress the stomach to decrease the amount of spillage into the abdominal cavity the patient should be given iv broad spectrum antibiotics antibiotics should cover the gram negative and anaerobes if the patient is not already on intravenous PPI, this should be started as well as the triple therapy. So what is the treatment of choice uh, for peptic ulcer disease, perforated peptic ulcer disease? So this you need to remember. Graham's patch repair. So few steps I will elaborate. Whenever you are going to explore any patient in emergency, the procedure is called exploratory lipotomy and the standard in CN for exploratory lipotomy is the standard midline long in CN starting from the sternum down to the pelvis. You open the abdomen up and you find all the fluid and the contents of the stomach in the abdominal cavity. You clean the abdominal cavity, you wash the abdominal cavity, then you start with a provisional diagnosis in mind that it can be a perforated peptic ulcer. Then you start visualizing the duodenum and stomach and look for any perforation. Mind it, when it is a gastric ulcer, the perforation can happen in the posterior wall also. So you have to look in the posterior wall of the stomach also uh, and, and the duodenum anterior wall. So when we talk about the duodenal perforations, the treatment of choice is Graham patch. What we do in Graham patch is this is the 
opening. I hope you can see it clearly. You pass the vicral suture, which are absorbable sutures, to size 2O. Then you take a piece of momentum and put it under the sutures and tie the sutures over it. So this is called Graham's mental patch repair for the perforated duodenum ulcer. Why do we place the omentum? This is uh, very important to understand. The omentum produces the high levels of tissue factors. We all know that. Leading to fibrin formation and sealing the perforation. And sometimes it helps in stop the bleeding. Because it acts as an ideas fall from it reduction. Uh, we'll be waiting for your feedback. Uh, thank you very much.